Good morning and welcome to Next Level Church. Uh, if we haven't yet met, my name is Brad Medford. I work here um, at the church, primarily in the areas of digital ministries, but uh, on occasion do get the opportunity uh, to stand on the stage, and I'm glad to do that today. Uh, I'm going to walk with you as we wrap up this series on the book of James. Um, before we jump in, I just want to give you a reminder that uh, always, whenever I teach, my hope is that you will feel like we are learning together. I am certainly not the authority on the text today. I'm simply somebody who has tried to walk with Jesus for over 20 years, uh, failed a lot, made a lot of mistakes, and uh, hopefully learned a few things along the way. Uh, we are continuing, as I said, and concluding a series on the book of James today uh, that is entitled Faith IRL, so Faith in Real Life. In this series, we've been working our way chapter by chapter, in some cases verse by verse, through the book of James. And here's what we've said all, all series about this book. The book of James was written to instruct Christians to live their faith in a world that doesn't carry the same values as the kingdom of of God. So that is our aim today as we wrap up and cover this last chapter. Um, a quick word, if you don't consider yourself a Christian, first off, thanks for joining us. Um, it's definitely our desire that this would be a safe place for you to explore Christianity. Uh, but as this book is aimed, aimed at Christians, relax, you're off the hook. Um, that said, I do think that this uh, will give you some principles that will be helpful uh, if you'll lean in. So regardless of whether you call yourself a Christian, no worries, uh, let's jump in. Um, the title of this message is don't suffer alone. Uh, so I want to tell you up front, before we go to what James has to say, that the practical advice of James 5 can largely be summed up by this statement, don't suffer alone. So with that, you already know that at least a good portion of our discussion today is on this topic of suffering. And I want to lay out a few ground rules as we talk about that and, and what James has to say about it. Uh, first and foremost, this will not be an exhaustive discussion of suffering. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about the topic, uh, and there's no way for me to cover it all today. Uh, there are also innumerable ways in which we human beings can and have suffered in this world. Some of it is self-inflicted, uh, some is not at all. I, I simply can't touch on, define, uh, explain, or help with every possible type of human suffering in one message. So I do ask for your understanding and forgiveness if it feels like I've left something out, because I have. <laughs> I promise I will. Uh, second, I'm going to speak of suffering mostly in general terms uh, for the purpose of the discussion. Uh, your suffering, however, is not general, and I, and I want to make that clear. Um, your suffering is incredibly specific, and so is mine. Uh, nothing I say today is meant to minimize any of the specifics of what you've been through in your life. I simply can't address it all and do it justice. So if I say something today and you're tempted to, to say back, you, you don't understand my situation. You don't understand how much I've suffered or how hard it is. I just want to go ahead and tell you, you're right. I don't understand and I can't. Uh, what I can say is that God does understand so I hope you'll hear him speaking to you today, and forgive me where it feels that I may have minimized. All right, disclaimers out of the way. Now we're good. All right, let's jump in. James begins what we call chapter 5 with a warning, and I say that just because as a reminder, James, when he wrote this, he, he didn't think about it as, as a, a book with chapters. He, he wrote a letter to the churches, and so everything for him was sort of in flow, and then we kind of came back later and broke it up. So this chapter 5 that he begins with a warning, it flows directly from what he had said lastly in chapter 4. So just as a reminder from a couple of weeks ago, um, you should watch that message if you haven't. Joseph did an excellent job um, teaching on James. James chapter 4, he, in that, at the end of that chapter, warns us against boasting about tomorrow and reminded us that our life is but a mist. <laughs> a quick note about this. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever made a five-year plan, okay? Keep your hand up if it worked out. <laughs> I, I don't know anybody that's made a five-year plan and it actually worked out exactly uh, to the way that they wrote it out. But anyway, uh, we roll out of that into chapter five. And the first thing that James does is he, he gives a, a warning to the rich, which is kind of um, interesting in, in warning that our, our lives are short and all of that stuff. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. You can read it yourself. But basically, James gives a strong reminder that we can't take anything with us. 
Um, he also tells us that we shouldn't let wealth consume us and turn us into greedy people who are willing to sacrifice the people in our lives for the sake of financial gain. After this, he begins the section that, at least in my Bible, uh, has those neat little subtitles. Um, it's titled, Patience in Suffering. Beginning in verse 7, this is where we're going to hang out for most of today. It says this, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So, uh, a lot to unpack there uh, and consider. James tells us to be patient until the Lord's coming. And I think, in effect, what James is saying to us is to wait for the Lord to provide. Certainly, he can be pointing to a bigger picture here, but I think very practically, James is telling us, wait on God. And he illustrates this idea with a reference to farming. Now, the people of his day would have understood that immediately. Uh, for, for any young people watching, um, vegetables don't come from the grocery store. They actually come from the ground. Uh, and it's a process. It's not an easy thing to accomplish. I, I won't go through a full farming lesson here, but there are definitely some takeaways from this reference. The question is, what does it look like for us to be patient in suffering the way that a farmer is patient? Here's the key. For the farmer... Patience is not passive. Uh, It's incredibly active. I think we can hear the word patience or the word wait and think that that means twiddle your thumbs, sit around, and do nothing. Certainly, it's what comes to mind for me. Maybe that's just an indictment on myself. Uh, The farmer, however, gets up and works the garden every day. He tills, he plants, he waters, he expects, and all of this is part of his patience, part of his waiting. Because ultimately, his work is still dependent on the rain. So he does his part faithfully while waiting on the rain. So what does that mean for us? Well, I think it it depends on your suffering. It depends on what you're going through. Again, nothing I say here is to minimize anything you're going through, but just to consider what God might be saying to us in James. Um, Is your marriage suffering? Maybe patience in that looks like working on your side while being patient with your spouse. Maybe it means serving your spouse, not expecting immediate returns, but trusting that God will bring about change in his time. Are you suffering physically? Maybe it's cancer, chronic pain, I don't know. Maybe patience in that looks like accepting the treatment laid out and being faithful in doing what you need to do, trusting that God will use the process. Uh, Are you suffering financially? Maybe the patience of the farmer means being really diligent with what you do have, trusting that God will give you what you need. Certainly, it means praying as you go. And we'll talk more about that as we get further into the chapter. Again, the patience of the farmer is not passive. Notice then what James says in verse 9. Don't grumble against one another. (laughs) Why would James throw that in here? Uh, It seems almost out of place, but think about it. When you're suffering, are you easy to get along with? (laughs) You've probably seen people in your life suffer. Uh, How easy were they to deal with in those moments or seasons? Suffering can make us bitter, resentful, jaded, angry people. But James knows, and I think you and I already know this too, if you can love people in the midst of their suffering or even in the midst of your own, you're on to something. That, that's what Jesus did. Jesus, when he was on the cross in the most suffering known to humankind, looks at the thief and has compassion. He's he's concerned about somebody else in that moment. And that's what he can do through us. Uh, Moving on in verses 10 and 11, James points to the prophets, specifically Job, as examples of what it looks like to be patient in suffering. Do you know the story of Job? Uh, well, either, either way, let me give you a quick recap. Uh, Job is a guy who literally have had every good thing stripped out of his life. He's effectively a case study on what happens when you take um, a guy who loves God but also has a lot of blessings in his life. What happens when you strip away all of those blessings? What will he do? 
Well, the short version is this. Uh, For Job, anyway, he remained faithful to God. Now, he had to fight off some bad advice from some so-called friends, uh, and he does plenty of lamenting and complaining, etc. He doesn't just walk through suffering with a smile. Uh, If Job had an Instagram, that period would not have been pretty. He did not maintain a highlight reel of curated selfies. No, he was wearing ashes. (laughs) But he always came back around to the truth that God is faithful. At the end of the book, it's Job's friends who are judged. Job receives back all that he had lost twofold. Now, what can we take from that? We already answered what it looks like to be patient like a farmer, and we said that the farmer's patience is active. Now, what does it look like to be patient like Job? First and foremost, I think Job teaches us that it's okay to be real and authentic in our suffering. We don't have to try to impress him or anybody else with our ability to act like life is wonderful. How many times have you known someone who seemed like they had it all together? Like their life was perfect. Like everything was just going great. And then seemingly all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, their marriage is ending or their health is failing or their family is a wreck or or some other catastrophe is happening. Now don't get me wrong, some things really do come out of nowhere, but so often we simply pretend things are great. We post highlights and we don't let people in. We suffer alone and in silence. That's not God's desire for us. Secondly, I would say Job teaches us to believe, even when it's hard, really hard. At the end of the day, God is in control and we aren't. God sees the, picture, the big picture and we don't. We see a very small, narrow one. Uh, when this is hard for me, which it often is, I come back to what Paul said in Romans 8.28. And we know... We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God uses everything that happens in our lives, even the worst things. Uh, Another way that I like to say this is God does not waste our pain. All of the bad stuff, all of the hardest moments, God finds a way to use them. And I think you've probably seen that in your own life, if you'll think about it. Have you ever had someone tell you about their struggles, about their pain? Did it help you? I want to talk more about that, but I want to read the next few verses of James first, because I think this is really going to help us tie everything together. In verse 13, James continues, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Perhaps the title of the message is is starting to make sense. For James... The way that we remain patient in suffering is very much linked to two things. Think back to the farmer. He worked the field while remaining patient, right? Job, he he told his friends, admittedly their answers weren't great, but he didn't just sit inside himself, and he talked to God a lot. He didn't twiddle his thumbs either. So I would combine all that we've discussed so far and say it this way. Active patience because it's not passive. Active patience is active in prayer and community. God doesn't ask us to do nothing. Certainly there's a place for be still and know that I am God, but he doesn't leave us there. He, he, he gives us something active to do in these places. He wants us to pray in faith, believing he is who he says he is and that he will work it all out one way or another. And he wants us to engage with the community around us, to be prayed for and encouraged and to share our stories so that they may encourage others. Speaking of stories, I I really believe that one of the main roles of suffering in our lives is that it gives us a story to share. And our stories can help and encourage others. So if you don't mind, I'd like to share a bit of my own story and how this scripture has impacted my life specifically. Uh, First off, you need to know uh, I'm a pretty serious introvert. 
Uh, I may not seem like it when I'm on stage, but when this is over, I will go home and I will take a nap or just generally hang out by myself uh, to recharge. Combine that with being an only child and you have somebody who spends a lot of time in his own head. My natural response to life is to process internally and try to think my way over or around any challenges that life presents. So from an early age, if I encountered a struggle, I figured it out. I didn't ask for help. I I just figured it out. Sometimes quickly, sometimes not, but almost always on my own. And I was pretty good at it, at least part of it. I found a lot of academic success, but not a lot of social success. Shocker. (laughs) I carried this into adulthood, and as most of you are probably aware... Problems don't go away in adulthood. Uh, The stakes just get higher. So I added a wife and two kids, a mortgage and a career, like a lot of us do. And I kept on trying to solve whatever issues came up in my head. What that really means is I began to suffer. Because I couldn't do it all on my own. I couldn't maintain all of those things with just what I had in my head. But I didn't want to tell anyone that. I suffered in silence. And that suffering manifested in many ways that um, I won't bother detailing here. But suffice to say, it it blew up in my face. (laughs) I had to learn that suffering alone in silence doesn't lead anywhere good. And it's not what God wants for us. And to be clear, I did pray a lot through it all. But I completely missed the other part. I said earlier that prayer and community are the active part of patience and suffering. I only got half of it. (laughs) The half that I could do in my head, conveniently enough. Um, It took a lot of pain for me to finally get out of my head and into real community. Um, There are a lot of small steps along the way in that journey, Uh, a lot of them just in the last couple of years, but one in particular comes to mind. Last July, I had coffee with a friend, and this is a guy I had known for a few years, but for whatever reason that day, um, he asked me how I was doing, which I've been asked hundreds of times. You probably have to. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm fine. Uh, For whatever reason that day, I decided to be honest, and I opened up, and I mean, he got everything, and he just listened. He didn't judge me. He just heard me, and ultimately, he asked me what I was going to do about it, and as I began to figure out what to do next, he committed to walking with me. It wasn't a one-and-done conversation, and he's been a great friend ever since. That experience, and many others like it, have allowed me to unlock at least a bit of what James is describing In this text, there is incredible power in the sharing of our story, in getting out of our own head, in bringing our suffering, whether self inflicted or not, into the light and into community. James in verse 16 of this chapter directly links prayer and confession of sin to one another to our healing. Isn't that what we want? Don't, don't, don't we want to get better, so to speak? Don't we want to get out of the suffering? James says this. It's, it's, it's about prayer and confession of sin to one another. It's about prayer and community. It is not always easy, but it works. I've certainly found this to be true in my own life, and I desperately want you to experience it as well. More importantly, I believe our Heavenly Father desires this for each of us. Remember, God doesn't waste anything. If you're not suffering right now, awesome. (laughs) Encourage someone who is. Be the community that they need. Build the relationships that you will need when suffering inevitably returns. If you are in the midst of suffering right now, don't go it alone. Talk to God and talk to somebody today. Don't suffer alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have invited us into your space, that, God, you have welcomed us with all of our problems, with all of our pains, with the various ways that we suffer. You have invited us to lay those things at your feet because you want to move in our lives. But but one of the ways, one of the primary ways in which you do that is through people. So God, I pray that today we would find the courage to engage with the people in our lives, to engage in community, and to just trust that, God, you are working there, that you will love us through 
community, that you will love us through other people praying for us and encouraging us. God, help us to see that and to feel that and to get that. Thank you that we don't have to do it alone. Give us the courage to stop doing it alone. Thank you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us today and just giving us the opportunity to speak into your life. Uh, before you head out, just a couple of reminders. One, if you'd like to help keep our church strong, you can head, head over to the website at nextlevelchurch.org slash give. There's several uh, giving options there, and anything you do will help us keep this church strong and keep us going on our mission to raise the reputation of Jesus where we live, work, and play. Also, if this message had any impact for you, you think it would help somebody, please like the video, share it, uh, subscribe to our channel. All of that kind of stuff helps us get this message out to more and more people, and we really appreciate it. Now, by way of benediction, I want to read to you what Jesus said in John 16. As we have considered suffering today and its, and its role in our lives and how to respond to it, Jesus said this to his disciples in John chapter 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart this week. Pray and engage with the people around you. Have a great day. We'll see you back next week.